understand them, and then bring to bear on that question, uh, an understanding of what our obligations are in addressing the burden of climate change, particularly in relationship to the first world countries to third world countries. So um, let me just get going with it. Uh, I just want to start with, uh, because there's a fair amount of this that's rather depressing, um, what at least might look like uh, some good news. Um, from the Paris Agreement, uh, the major countries of the world agreed to make an effort to uh, limit um, global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's one of these items. And they also agreed that developing countries uh, must provide financial resources to help developing countries. And I'm going to be re referring to uh, those two features as well as some other things here. Another example, rich countries must provide $100 billion from 2020 as a floor to help developing countries to make the transition beyond fossil fuels. Um, the problem is that these are all uh, commitments that have no binding force, so we have to move ahead from this. And for purposes of this talk, uh, I'll just make the following assumptions. We can come back to them in discussion if anybody wants to discuss them, but that global warming and consequent climate change are real. The principal cause is human emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, that the effects of global warming are potentially catastrophic, particularly if we exceed 2 degrees Celsius, perhaps even if we exceed 1.5. Uh, and these consequences are particularly devastating for the poorest people in the world. Uh, and we are already seeing the effects in such things as ocean acidification. It's a problem not only for coral reefs, but for lobsters off the coast of Maine. Uh, more severe storms. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan, uh, which killed over 6,000 people, was the strongest storm recorded at landfall. Um, and of course, we have here in the United States Hurricane Katrina, which is extremely destructive. Hurricane Sandy, which is unprecedented in the New York area. Uh, severe wildfires, uh, drought. This is in California. In 2014, a geologist at Berkeley uh, estimated that that year was the driest in 500 years. Which now they're experiencing the opposite kind of weather there, but severe droughts are on the increase. Um, and I just mentioned briefly that the Syrian refugee crisis began uh, as a drought crisis, which displaced over a million Syrian farmers whose farms became unworkable. Uh, sea level rise is also leading to uh, potential refugee crises in uh, Bangladesh. A three-foot rise in sea levels would submerge 20% of the country beneath the Bay of Bengal. Um, and of course, island nations are uh, facing serious problems of sea level rise right now. Uh, melting of the glaciers, which I'm sure you've read about. Um, the uh, uh, Antarctic ice sheet, if the whole of the West Antarctic ice sheet melted. It would raise global sea level by 16 feet. Uh, that would not happen immediately, but uh, Angus King, when he spoke at the University of Maine, um, he'd taken a trip to, to Greenland, and he said that um, the scientists he was talking to on the Greenland trip estimated that we are looking at now uh, sea level rise by the end of the century of about eight feet, uh, as much as a foot in the next 15 years, and then a foot every decade after that, if we don't do something very quickly. So uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has identified several categories of reasons of concern. And you can see here that uh, even at one degree, where it's just about where we are now, we're already entering into the high risk for unique and threatened systems, uh, extreme weather events, um, and if we get to two degrees, we'll be high level of risk for uh, almost all of these serious reasons for concern, including large-scale singular events, things like the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, 
uh, Greenland glaciers beyond, you know, melting beyond any, any control. Um, and emissions are still rising. Uh, as you can see, the United States and Europe are declining, but not nearly enough. China, by and large, is a major source of continued increase in emissions, not expected to peak anytime soon. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, best case scenario for staying below 2 degrees centigrade, would require us to have global emissions peak by 2020, if we're going to ha have the possibility of staying below 2 degrees and then slowly uh, CO2 declining after that. So that's just kind of re reminding ourselves of what we've probably heard many times. Um, and so just to give you a quick outline of the the philosophical part of the talk uh, about how to share the burdens of addressing climate change. Uh, I'm going to talk about principles that should govern our conduct. Uh, and first is what I call polluter pays principle. I'll talk about three different versions of that uh, and favor one of those. Uh, and then I'm going to argue that the polluter pays idea has to be complemented by an ability to pay principle. We don't only take account what, how much people are polluting, but how much are they able, given their resources, to contribute to the solution of the problem. Um, and the key idea here is that the consequences of climate change fall heavily on the global poor. They don't have much responsibility, nor do they have capacity to address it. And without an ability to pay principle, they will face uh, a terrible dilemma between developing their economies out of poverty or uh, climate change mitigation. They have to choose between them and they can't do both without the help of wealthier countries. Therefore, the wealthy have a duty to make greater emissions reductions and share the costs of emissions reductions by the poorer countries so that the poor can develop. Uh, and there are also strong reasons why, on a domestic level, we should combine polluter pays with ability to pay. Now, what I'm arguing for actually fits consistently with uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which, um, going back to the first climate change agreements, stipulated that greenhouse gas stabilization should be achieved on the basis of equity in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities. In other words, the countries that are parties to these agreements they have a responsibility for their emissions. If they pollute, they should pay for their pollution. But we should also take into account their respective capacities, their ability to pay for the solutions to climate change. We have to combine those two principles. So that's polluter pays and ability to pay. Uh, and furthermore, there's recognized a right to all the countries of the earth to sustainable development. No country should be permanently locked into poverty. So to come back to the polluter pays principle, the first I'm calling a future polluter pays principle, and I associate it with George W. Bush because he's one of many to articulate this, but if we go back to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, it set targets for developed countries to limit greenhouse gas emissions between from uh, uh, by 2012 to 5% below 1990 levels, and a little bit higher for Europe and the United States. Now, clearly, those goals were not met. Um, um, but the important thing about the, that initial agreement was that it exempted developing countries like China and India. Uh, and at that time, uh, and notice here that this is, there, was not, there was a consensus across parties on this. The Byrd-Hagel resolution, which passed the US Senate by a vote of 95 to 0, shortly before the Kyoto meeting, opposed any exemptions for developing countries. Uh, President Bush objected to the agreement because he thought it unfair that China and India were exempted from that treaty. The principle of fairness invoked here, let us call it the future polluter pays principle, could be expressed as follows. All polluters have an equal obligation not to pollute, regardless of history of past pollution or regardless of ability to pay. 
It would follow that China and India should be under the same emissions targets as developed countries. And because they were exempted, the United States wanted to have nothing to do with it. And the U.S. Senate was basically a universal agreement on that. So, uh, a better principle than that would take into account historical emissions. Uh, and it would, uh, in one version, which I'm going to criticize <coughs> in a moment, it would hold countries responsible. That's why I call it collectivist. It's the United States as a, an entity has polluted, it is responsible, mm -hmm. and so on with other countries. Uh, just quickly to look at the, um, the historical emissions. If you go back to 1850, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you see here that the uh, United States, going back that far, would be responsible for 27% of global emissions from 1850 to 2011. Uh, European Union, 25%. China, only 11%, and so on. Uh, if you start in 1990, which is roughly the time when there was global agreement that climate change exists and we have to do something about it, you see how the United States share shrinks to 16%. Uh, China has grown to 15 Europe is smaller, and so on. So, and what, so uh, oh, that oh. is, I think, the rest, rest of the of world. The world. Yeah. Of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what date you pick is the time from which there is responsibility makes a difference. Uh, but to back up, uh, okay, what's wrong with the historical collectivist polluted pace principle? First of all, there's a problem of excusable ignorance. Uh, in 1850, nobody knew that there was a problem of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that's true in, arguably down to 1990. Uh, earlier generations, People in 1850 or 1930, they're no longer around. But they were the ones doing the polluting. So why should we be responsible for them now? Uh, and then there's a, the issue of collective versus individual agency. Uh, the United States pollutes, but there are poor people in the United States that don't pollute very much. And there are wealthy people in India and China who are polluting. So if you could take account of individual responsibility, that would be better than collective agency. So. What I would argue for in, in the polluter pays principle, the best approach is an individualist polluter pays principle, hold each person responsible for their own pollution. At least that's the concept. And you can translate that into national obligations, but that's what we, how we want to conceptualize it. And one proposal made by some of you may know the philosopher Peter Singer is an equal per capita shares. So um, imagine that we have. Uh, well, every person is entitled to an equal per capita share of emission rights compatible with sustaining an atmosphere for all, now and in the future. And I'll explain how I arrived at this figure in, in a minute, but I would argue that that's about three metric tons of carbon dioxide per person per year over the next 30 years. Um, and I arrived at this figure first by taking account of the notion of a carbon budget. Um, World Wildlife Federation offers this definition. A carbon budget can be defined as a tolerable quantity of greenhouse gas emissions that can be emitted in total over a specified time. The budget needs to be in line with what is scientifically required to keep global warming and thus climate change tolerable. Uh, and the notion of a global budget, you can picture it like this. Um, the, uh, there's only so much carbon dioxide we can put into the atmosphere. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. We've put in about half what we can put in up to now. And so over the next few decades, there's only so much more we can put in before we dangerously threaten the, uh, the rise in the global temperature beyond 2 degrees centigrade. Uh, another way to Imagine it is to think of it as like a bathtub. If, if the climate is in balance, the water that the, the, the gases that are flowing in are also being sucked out, largely by the ocean, by uh, trees, and, and other uh, biological life that pulls the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, we are very much out of balance because uh, by burning fossil fuels, we're pouring more 
carbon into the atmosphere, also by cutting down trees or removing some of the carbon sink. Uh, and uh, as global temperature rises, actually the size of the drain shrinks because you have forests dying off, uh, the ocean will not absorb as much. Uh, and so the problem is, okay, how do we stop this flow in? Uh, that's, that's the major challenge that we why, face. Why are the bullets below sinks of carbon? Yeah, land uptake and ocean uptake is okay. what's cut off there. And as global temperature increases, the size of the drain shrinks. Okay. Um, so, this might be the most important scientific slide that we look at. Um, the, uh, this is the, the blue line is rising CO2 emissions. Uh, and if emissions were to have stopped at 2012, then we could expect a stabilization of the CO2 in the atmosphere uh, at a level that would keep the global temperature only about a degree above pre-industrial levels. And it would be stable there for a very long time. Now, the important thing to note is that once the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, it's there for a very long time. Um, according to the, uh, the uh, uh, International Framework, the uh, AR5 report, uh, the removal of all the human emitted CO2 from the atmosphere by natural processes will take a few hundred thousand years. So once, once the water's in the tub, it's not going out, okay? Uh, and so if we go up to, if emissions stop at 2050, uh, we, we can, the global temperature will rise two degrees and it's going to stay there and possibly rise over decades that, that follow. And if we go all the way up uh, to 2100 before emissions stop, uh, then the temperature is going to rise four degrees or more and continue rising. And the continual rise is partly due to uh, positive feedback loops, permafrost melts, and then methane is released, and, uh, and other things. And the, 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 north, the, the polar ice cap melts, and then instead of reflecting light, it's absorbing heat. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of effects. Uh, so, um, the, so we've got this fixed carbon budget. And the problem is that the later we peak, the faster we have to reduce our emissions. So if we uh, wait until 2025, then to, to, for emissions to peak, we will dump so much more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at that point, that we've got to cease almost immediately. And that is impossible. And if we wait till 2020, it's still a pretty steep curve. And we've already passed 2015, but you can see that we've got a little more room to maneuver. But this is kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, now, these are several different carbon budgets. Uh, and the, the gray ones are from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. Uh, if we give ourselves um, 1,410 gigatons of carbon dioxide to expend in the next, before we stop, uh, then we have a better than one-third chance of staying below two degrees centigrade. Uh, if, we, um, if we reduce it to 1120 gigatons, then we got a better than 50% chance. Uh, if we reduce it still more to 1,010, We've got a better than 50, that's 66%. Uh, and the blue bars are another study that I'll be referring to, what they call a weak 2, to two uh, degree centigrade. It's a little, it's in between 33 and 50. And the strong 2C, which is much greater than 66%. Uh, so if we really seriously want to stay below 2 degrees centigrade, we should have a carbon budget of about 785. And the three, uh, three uh, tons per year budget that I mentioned earlier is right between these two. So this uh, is globally. Global, that's right, global. And the, the G8 pathway is the budget 
that if, if all the countries keep their Paris commitments, this is the carbon budget they're giving ourselves. So not a very good chance of staying below 2 degrees centigrade on that. But I think anyone who seriously looked at the Paris Agreement thought, OK, it's not enough, but at least people are, are starting. And we can improve on our goals as we go along. So quickly, how I got to the, the figure of three metric tons of CO2 per person, well, with the goal of staying below 2 degrees centigrade, the carbon budget would be between those last two bars I mentioned, 785 to 110. Divide that total carbon budget by the world population, and I estimated between 7 and 8 million because we're at 7, but we'll be at 8 by 20, 30 or 40. Uh, and then take 80% of that over the next 30 years because we're probably not going to get completely off carbon by mid-century, give ourselves later to get off the rest of the 20% we have in our budget, and then divide by 30 to get the annual budget per capita over the next 30 years. And if you do that, it comes out to <coughs> three uh, metric tons of CO2 per person on the planet. That's, that's the planetary average. Now, here's, here is a very sobering set of statistics. The, the global average now of our carbon emissions is already five tons. We're already globally dumping twice as much as we are entitled to give ourselves if we want to get off carbon in 30 years. The United States is putting out 16.4 tons per person per year. So we're over five times our, our allowance. Uh, China, Europe, doing much better. Poorer countries, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, they've they're, they're well below what is expected of them, but we're using their share. And if you want a sort of a, an image, imagine we've got a week we're going to stop eating bread and we're going to start eating fresh vegetables. Uh, but we've got a week to make the transition, and we've only got a loaf of bread to spend over that week. Well, uh, globally, we're eating not two slices a day as we should, but four slices a day. And our share of that in the United States, we're eating 10 slices on Monday. And that leaves, you know, four for the rest of the week. So that's, that's kind of an image of what we're doing compared to what we should do if we want to uh, get where we need to go. So implications. Uh, the United, if, you were, if we're serious about two degrees centigrade, the United States should immediately reduce emissions by 80% and prepare for further reductions by mid-century. I don't think that can be done. Or reduce 80% as soon as possible and get below three tons per capita before mid-century because if we keep spending more now, we're going to have to use less later. Or, and this is I think the, the one possible way we have a realistic solution, pay other people to reduce what we cannot reduce. Uh, and I'll explain how that might work in a bit. Question, is this too demanding? Are we asking too much of Americans and other wealthy Europeans? <laughs> and so or is it not demanding enough? This does not even take into account pre-1990 emissions. Uh, we live with the benefit of the wealth created by carbon emissions over a century. We continue to enjoy the benefit of that. We're not even calculating for that. Um, and I want to do a thought experiment. It's sort of a intuitive way of getting at the moral parameters here. Uh, just imagine two countries. They're, these don't match any real countries, but I think it fixes the moral intuitions. Imagine a rich, rich country where everybody makes more than $15,000 a year. Some may make a billion, but nobody makes less than 15000 So everybody's above poverty. And this country is expending twice its emissions allowance, six tons of carbon per year. And then imagine a poor country, which uh, nobody makes more than 5,000 a year. The wealthiest people are at that level, and half of the population lives on less than $2 a day, which in fact, about half the world lives on, on that. And for different kinds of reasons, they're burning twice their, their quota because they're doing slash-and-burn agriculture, because they're burning lots of coal and so on. 
or poor, bad technology. So they're, they're also putting out six tons per person. Okay? Now, if we have the equal emissions reductions without taking account of ability to pay, but just polluter pays, then the people in the poor country have even fewer resources for subsistence needs, lower incomes and lower productivity because of the foregone emissions, so that people in the rich country can enjoy more luxuries. How can people in the rich country justify this to people in the poor country if it is possible for the rich to assume more of the costs, very reductions and or more of the costs of the poor country's reductions, with the only loss to themselves being a reduction in luxury goods? It's a sort of a rhetorical question, but it's one that I don't think there's a, a decent answer to. Um, we should be prepared to reduce some of our luxuries so that others may simply live. Now, so, uh, we need to complement polluter pays, then, with an ability to pay principle. In other words, we need to take account of both responsibility for emissions, past, present, and future, and the capacity to reduce emissions and pay for the costs. So people in a country like Iceland, that has all this geothermal, they don't burn lots of carbon, but they're wealthy, and they have some obligation to help people who, who can't get out of poverty uh, by contributing the ability to pay part of this. They won't have a big responsibility component, but they still have an ability to pay. Uh, now, here's where we are today, just in terms of China and the U.S. China's emissions are still continuing to rise. The United States has declined, but not nearly enough. Uh, China promises that it will peak its emissions by 2030. That's not soon enough. Um, the United States has promised to cut its emissions 17% by 2020, 28% by 2025. That's Obama's clean power plan. It may soon to be history, but, uh, but that's, that's the goal. Uh, and that's not nearly enough. Uh, in fact, there have been several studies of the projected global warming if all the countries keep their Paris agreements. And uh, basically, what this... Uh, this shows is the probability of limiting global warming to the specified temperature by 2100. So, just to take the first example, the um, Climate Action Tracker has predicted that there's a 66% chance of keeping global warming to 3 degrees by 2100, if we keep the Paris Agreements. MIT did several different ranges, um, a 50% chance of keeping global warming to 3.7 degrees, only a 5% chance of keeping it to 3.1. But a 95% chance that it won't go over 5.2 degrees. Oh, nice. okay, so, uh, and you, what, what these all seem to, sh to show is that we're, we're likely to be going to 3 degrees, uh, even if all these commitments are kept. So the challenge. Under what kind of climate policy regime can the world reduce emissions by 80% in 30 years within a shrinking carbon budget in the midst of a development crisis? Where, and these are World Bank figures where almost a billion people live on less than $2 a day. Over a billion people still lack access to electricity. 9% lack access to fresh water. 11% are chronically undernourished. And 17,000 children under five die every day for mostly preventable causes. Uh, we cannot ignore this side of the problem either. So, uh, uh, a group that I found very uh, interesting to, to study is uh, called uh, Climate Equity. Uh, and if you go to this website, you can play around with figures and, and input different things to get different kinds of projections. But basically what they do is they look at several different global mitigation pathways. The gray line is just business as usual, nothing changes. That's where we're headed uh, in terms of uh, CO2 equivalent uh, by 2030. And the uh, red line is what we call the, the G8 pathway, 
on that bar graph, it was the one farthest to the right. Countries keep their Paris agreements. That's where we're headed. Uh, the blue line is uh, what we call the weak 2C pathway. Got a, you know, a, I think a 30% chance of staying below 2C if we get on that. And the strong 2C pathway is the green line. Uh, so those are, these are the pathways we're going to be referring to. Uh, so climate equity then comes up with this concept of national fair shares. And it's, I mentioned earlier, you want something that's individualist but that can be translated into national obligations. So the basic idea is for a given global mitigation pathway, one of those lines on that previous graph, taking account of both capacity, wealth and responsibility, and allowing for exclusion of income and emissions below a development threshold. The idea is emissions below for poor people and income for the very poorest. We're not going to touch that. Uh, what are nations responsible to do? A national fair share will involve domestic reductions and it will involve either support for mitigation elsewhere if you're a wealthy country or receipt of support if you're a poor one. So wealthy and high emitting countries, their fair share uh, will be greater than their domestic mitigation potential. The United States is responsible, our share of the responsibility is greater than what we can domestically reduce. And for a poor and low emitting country, the domestic mitigation potential is greater than the fair share. As a country like India, they're not emitting very much. So their fair share is not that great. Uh, they're also poor, so they don't have a lot of capacity. But they've got a lot of mitigation potential. They're already below three metric tons per person, so they can absorb the, the reductions more than, say, people in the United States. So it's with that idea that we try to work out what are national fair shares. And so they call this the greenhouse development rights approach to effort share. Um, so you define a national obligation on the basis of a share of mitigation and adaptation costs, and this is based on capacity, resources to be able to pay without sacrificing necessities. Uh, and they pick $20 per day as the income below which you don't have, you're not considered to be responsible for paying because of capacity. And that comes out to $7,500 a year as a development threshold. And then uh, responsibility, what have you contributed and are contributing to climate change? Uh, and they use cumulative CO2 emissions, excluding what they call subsistence emissions. That is, emissions corresponding to consumption below the development threshold. So if you're a poor farmer and you're burning trees and stuff, that, those emissions are not, you're not held responsible for those. They, they add the, clearly to the total emissions, but you're not held responsible for reducing those if they're part of what you need to just subsist. And to get a sort of graph version of this, compared to India, China, the U.S., in terms of capacity, uh, there are a lot of people in India living on less than $20 per day. So the income in India that can be contributed in terms of their capacity is relatively small. In China, similarly, a lot of people below $20 a day, although they have more wealth that's above that threshold, they should be those wealthy people in China should be held responsible for contributing because of capacity. In the United States, we have some people below the threshold, but a lot who are above it, and who can contribute in terms of capacity. And then in terms of uh, emissions responsibility, um, the, the graph is a little bit old, but it's the principle you want to take from this. So you see the United States, we have large cumulative emissions. This is from uh, 1990. Uh, but the excluded emissions, because of people falling below the development threshold, is relatively small. A lot of emissions for which you're responsible. In China, it's just the reverse. They, you can see they are now emitting. Well, this, by now, this is going to rise above the EU 27. Uh, but the amount for which they're responsible is relatively small because a lot of those emissions are still what you might call subsistence emissions. Uh, so, uh, when you put these two things together, responsibility, capacity, 
you get what they call a responsibility capacity index. So if, say, the United States were responsible for 37% of global emissions and 29%, we have 29% of the capacity, you just average those and you get a responsibility capacity index of 33%. And China, uh, relatively small responsibility and capacity, and you combine those and you get their responsibility capacity index. Now the interesting thing is, over time, because China becomes wealthier, their RCI goes up. In the United States, because China is going up, ours, over time, begins to go down. And that makes China's, oh, sorry. Yeah. See, China is, starting in 2010, it would be 4%. By 2020, it goes up to 9%, and up to 13 but On the original ring graph you showed us, China had 15% responsibility. Yeah. Um, it depends on which cutoff date, but this is... Um, Oh, using a, before they started to develop? Uh... Well, they're arriving at this part because they're excluding subsistence emissions. Right. So the, the figures won't exactly coincide because the subsistence emissions are not part of your responsibility or capacity. A lot of China's off, so that's why you get a, a smaller figure there. Um, okay, so... Uh, what you want to look at here is just this, this uh, middle set of <clears throat> equity centers. So we're going to look at three different scenarios for the United States trying to get to the strong two degree pathway. Good chance of staying below two degrees centigrade. And what we call the low equity setting, that's without ability to pay, without taking that into account. We're just looking at responsibility and only responsibility since 1990. What we call the medium equity uh, is a weak progressivity. What that means here is that we do factor in ability to pay in the sense of a threshold. Countries falling below the threshold, people falling below the threshold do not have to contribute money. They do not have to reduce emissions. And we push the responsibility back to 1950 uh, because people are still around now who were polluting in 1950. So even though we didn't have a firm grip on climate change, we'll still hold people responsible. The high equity setting pushes responsibility back to the Industrial Revolution, and it adds more progressivity, like a pro progressive income tax, to take into account increasing ability to pay as people get wealthier. I'm going to be interested mainly in these two. Um, this, I think, you could say a lot for it philosophically, but in terms of what's practically possible, if we can even get the low equity, I think we can consider ourselves fortunate. Uh, so, the United States, uh, with a uh, projected percent of global responsibility capacity index in 2025, on the low equity setting, that would be 19% of capacity responsibility uh, in 2025. And the middle equity would be 29.7%, because we more responsible for more of our emissions in the past, and more uh, of our ability to pay is taken into account. Now, uh, the mitigation share in terms of metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent would be 6,700 metric tons. Uh, and if we had to do all of that in terms of emissions reduction, we'd have to reduce our emissions to 90% below the 1990 level uh, by 2025. Nobody's talking about doing that. Okay. So what the climate equity approach says, okay, it's within the realm of technical possibility to reduce our emissions by 46% below 1990 levels by 2025. And then assume responsibility for another you know, equivalent of 44% that we support mitigation elsewhere. So we basically, we pay the Chinese to reduce their emissions. So we pay the Indians not to add more uh, coal-fired power plants and the like. Mm -hmm. However it works out effectively to do that. Now if you look at the, the middle equity setting, uh, 
our responsibility on the middle equity setting, which takes into account ability to pay as well as responsibility, is that we have to reduce our emissions to 149 percent <laughs> below 1990 levels. That's a physical impossibility, right? You can't reduce your emissions more than 100 percent. Okay, so if we're going to take into account fairness, uh, we would have to reduce our. And again, they're they're just saying consistently the most we could do by 2025 is 46 percent below 1990 levels. But we'd have to then have a much bigger share of responsibility for reduction of emissions elsewhere. You might think of, uh, I'm not sure what the dollar figure would be on this, but if you try to calculate, uh, in terms of the opposing carbon tax, what are we paying? The carbon tax, uh, and we'd have to do, you know, maybe twice that amount of reduction in emissions elsewhere. It's, it's in the tens or maybe hundreds of billions of dollars, I think, that we would have to be transferring elsewhere. If we want to be serious about treating other people fairly in terms of everybody having an equal share and taking into account ability to pay. Uh, so if you do the same thing in terms of a graph. This is the U.S. pledge, that little diamond there, uh, for the Paris Agreement. Uh, basically, they're saying we should double our emissions reductions compared to that. 46% rather than 20 something percent. <laughs> And double that amount uh, we need to do to reduce emissions elsewhere. And this band is, depends on um, how exactly you calculate fairness. You've got low equity, medium equity, high equity. But the one down the middle is the mid medium equity setting. So we need to be responsible for much more than our emissions elsewhere. Um, and if you look at China, it's kind of the mirror image of this. Uh, they are responsible for their own emissions, but then other people are responsible for helping them with even more than that share of their emissions, depending on, it's in that blue band somewhere, depending on how you judge the equity set. Um, and you get similar uh, charts for EU and India. I'll just skip over those, because it's kind of the basic idea. And so, to look at the United States under three different emissions pathways. The, the G8 pathway, that's if we go to three degrees, basically, and we do what we promised in the Paris Agreements, but no more. We're right on target with our pledge. Uh, but to take care of the responsibility that we, uh, the, the help we give to other countries to do their share, we need to do that much more in terms of mitigation elsewhere. The weak two-degree set pathway, where you know, we have a, a third chance of staying below um, two degrees, where we need to increase our domestic emissions and probably double that amount elsewhere. And the strong two-C pathway, uh, we got to more than double, we could fully double our emissions and do even more uh, in terms of emissions elsewhere. In China, again, it's kind of a mirror image of that. Uh, so, uh, what can be done? Um, we'll start with, I think, what's the, the policy that would do the most that we have some chance of getting in the near term, and that is a carbon tax or a carbon fee. Uh, one proposal, which a number of others here can speak to in the discussion, Citizens Climate Lobby has proposed a carbon fee beginning at $15 per ton of CO2 equivalent emissions assessed at the mine, well, the port of entry. It would rise <coughs> annually by $10 or whatever the Department of Energy assesses as necessary in order to reduce our emissions to 10% of 1990 levels by 2050. It's revenue neutral, meaning that all the revenue collected would be returned to citizens in the form of per capita dividends. And Economists have studied this and calculated that the majority of households will experience net financial gains from the carbon tax. Uh, they get more in dividends than they will pay out in higher energy prices. Uh, so why a tax? Well, because it internalizes the environmental cost of fossil fuel pollution. Now we are 
burning carbon in all kinds of ways, and we're not factoring into the cost of that, the environmental <coughs> cost, the destruction that's to come, the health effects, and so forth. What it, a tax does is it ends the rent-free use by polluters of the atmospheric sink. Uh, basically, they're using it as a, we are using it as a sink. We're dumping stuff into it. Uh, if you go to the dump outside of town and you want to dump stuff, you have to pay a fee. We're not paying the fee to dump things into the atmosphere. So this ends that rent-free use. Uh, it will encourage energy conservation. It makes renewables more competitive because as the price of heating oil and gasoline and so on goes up, the solar and wind power and tidal and so forth will be more competitive because the price of fossil fuels goes up and this is better market arrangement. Other benefits, reduced air pollution, uh, new jobs in installing solar panels and windmills and the like. Uh, one study, two million jobs after 10 years and 2.8 million after 20 years. Quite a bit better than the pipeline. Uh, so, why a dividend? Uh, well, consumption taxes are regressive. Um, low income households spend a higher proportion of their household budget on energy. So, if you tax energy, it's going to hit them hard. Uh, and uh, that's true of any consumption tax. Uh, and so, the dividend compensates for that burden on low-income households. Um, and with 100% of the, the revenue returned to dividends, over half of households will receive a net benefit. I think also crucially important, it makes a carbon tax, which we would have to start as soon as we can and then continue for decades. It makes it politically feasible because taxes, you know, they're not popular. And you put one in place and there's pressure to take it away. How do you make that sustainable politically over time? Well, if people are getting an immediate benefit from it, then that makes it more politically feasible, as well as fair. The issue of regressive taxes, changing that through a carbon dividend, that's the fairness <coughs> part of the political feasibility is that people buy into it and they get a benefit. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of, of climate change is the dangers are far off in the future. They affect other people. So they, they tax our imagination. We, we can't wrap our minds around it. And it's far, hard for us to care about people way, far away in, in the distant future. So if you can give people an immediate benefit uh, from the policies that address those problems, it makes it psychologically and socially and politically possible. Uh, how much would the dividend be? Well, if it started in 2015, the annual dividend for a family of four would rise to $3,456 in 2025, over $4,000 in 2035. Uh, and to bring it back to, because the, the, the Citizens Climate Lobby plan doesn't go far enough. Uh, in order to reach 61% below 2005 levels, or which is the same thing, 46% below 1990 levels by 2025. That's the strong 2C pathway. To get to there, um, and this is a very speculative thing I've calculated here, but if you started in 2017 with a tax of $35 per ton, not 15, and you increased it by $35 a year rather than $10 a year, <coughs> Then by 2025, the tax would be $280 a ton, and you'd get the corresponding dividends I'm showing there. Uh, according to a calculator that you can get at the Carbon Tax Center, that would bring the emissions down uh, to 46% below 1990. <coughs> now, I don't know if in fact it would. Okay. The calculator is extrapolating from what we know about how markets respond to increasing prices. You raise the gasoline price so much and the usage goes down and people shift their car purchases. But nobody's ever instituted a tax that's quite that demanding. So nobody knows. It might simply throw the economy into recession. Okay. Now that would reduce emissions. <laughs> But we probably don't want to try to do it that way. Okay. So that's why I say this is speculative. Nobody's, I know, is proposing this. But I'm trying to just give you a sense of 
where the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is one of the best plans out there, uh, still gets us only halfway to the goal. Um, so, um, maybe we need to do other things. Uh, some people are now talking about a planned degrowth. We need to say, we're going to reduce our consumption. We're not going to con continue to grow the economy just in a, a greener way. We need to reduce our consumption because most of what we consume in directly or indirectly involves carbon emissions. I heard a talk recently of someone who'd been studying you know, for a while in Sweden, that the Swedes were very proud that they'd reduced their carbon emissions, but when you factored in the increase in imports from China, from production that they had outsourced from Sweden, they'd reduced their emissions, but now the emissions are being produced in China for the goods they're importing and consuming. So their consumption is related to carbon emissions Elsewhere. So if we want to reduce carbon emissions overall, there may be no way around it than to reduce our consumption. And we may not be able to just do that by a bunch of individual decisions. We may need to collectively decide how we're going to power ourselves down. Uh, carbon tax gets us on that path, but we may need to do other things besides that. Uh, there are also questions about whether all the revenue from a carbon fee should go to dividends. Uh, there's a lot of argument, and some will say, uh, based partly on the Paris Commitment, that we should use some of this money for transition in developing countries. Um, because it's their atmosphere as well as ours. Um, or a lot of workers will be displaced. These, the latest election is a sign of you know, coal miners out of work. Who do they vote for? They're not voting for people calling for a carbon tax. Right? But, but maybe if, if we use uh, some of that funds to help workers transition out of those industries and something else, but that's money away from a dividend and to this purpose. And then, of course, a lot of people argue for investment in renewable energy. Um, there was a big debate in Washington state over a state carbon tax, and people divided precisely over, do you give the money back uh, you know, revenue neutral dividend to everybody or do you spend on renewable energy and the proponents of the tax divided and the measure failed. So these are big issues that we're going to have to confront. So to conclude, polluter pays is a demanding principle, but it's not demanding enough. The ability to pay should also guide policy. Implications, as rapid reductions in carbon emissions as possible and Wealthy countries giving support to poorer countries. Staying below 2 degrees centigrade is technically possible. I don't know if it's politically or socially possible, but it is, I think, still technically possible. And one indispensable policy on the way to that is a carbon fee and dividend. And I'll conclude with this one other slide. This has been a very wonkish talk, but um, Bill McKibben, one of the leaders of 350.org, uh, says the following. This is Standing Rock where people are opposing the, the pipeline. And Bill McKibben says, uh, we're no longer talking about cutting emissions one or two percent a year. Now, with the poles actually melting, coral reefs literally dying in a matter of weeks, and temperatures shattering new records every month, we need to do everything. Not just a price on carbon, but dramatic subsidies for renewables to speed their spread. Not just a price on carbon, but an end to producing oil and gas on public land. Not just a price on carbon, but a ban on fracking, which is sending clouds of methane into the atmosphere. Not just a price on carbon, but a dozen other major regulatory changes that have some chance of cutting emissions the 6 or 7 percent a year that's now required, a rate far greater than we've ever seen before. So with that, Thought I would stop. Thank you. Thank you.